Hey, welcome back to another episode of Battle Buddy Podcast. If, if you are struggling with mental health and you have gone through that claim process and maybe you've hit that brick wall uh, where you need a nexus letter, you need some advice, you need those next steps, right? You, whatever the case may be, you want to you pay attention to this episode today. Uh, I've got a doctor on here. We're going to talk a lot about mental health, psychology, things like that, nexus letters, DBQs, a lot of fancy VA claim stuff. So if that's something of interest to you or something that can help you, you definitely want to pay attention today. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. All right, so welcome to the show, Dr. Prashant Sharma. I said that uh, right, correctly? You did, you did. Oh, yeah. look at that, look at that. I'm <laughs> notorious for messing things up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was perfect. So, on top <laughs> nice of that, to... you're not yeah. only a doctor, but you're an Air Force veteran. Uh, that's right, yeah. That's right. Um, I was a flight surgeon in the Air Force uh, many years ago, but yeah. <laughs> many years ago. You know what, it's been many years for me too since I threw, threw that uniform on, and I can yeah. guarantee you it doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh just let's just back up a little bit and you know what's what's your story like you know why'd you get in the military what'd you do you know well obviously you're a flight surgeon but you know those kind of things tell us share a little bit sure. about your story sure absolutely yeah thanks for having me on uh i'm super excited for this uh yeah so basically you know um my uh brother was in the marines and uh you know i really wanted to join the military as well and um, also wanted to go to medical school and I was like, all right, how do we combine these things? Right. And, and, uh, have someone pay for med school as well. <laughs> and, uh, one, you know, went, yeah. went through the air force on that. Um, so it was great. You know, they, uh, they pay for school and, uh, I went through and initially I was activated as a, a flight surgeon, which is essentially, uh, uh, doing primary care, uh, for air crew and their families, things like that, you know? and um, aerospace medicine, and it was great. It was a lot of uh, fun times, you know, uh, went on a deployment as well, which was interesting, challenging, but good stuff. Um, and uh, came back uh, and, you know, ended up getting out and went to a psychiatry residency. So, so what happened was when I was in the military, I was really gravitated towards um, the patients who had mental illness, you know, like depression, PTSD, anxiety, things like that. And that's when I knew I was like, all right, I got to get into this field. Um, so I ended up going to uh, residency to specialize in that. Um, and then once I was done with the residency, um, I, I practiced regular psychiatry, but then I got into these uh, nexus letters and independent uh, medical opinions and things like that to help veterans you know, kind of clarify their case and uh, get their applications approved and uh, started doing that. And, and uh, so I do a combination of both uh, these days as well. That's awesome because I, I you know most doctors anybody goes to aren't going to have military experience. They're not going to be able to kind of relate or be able to maybe put things in words the way they need to be put into words to describe Absolutely. somebody. Because, you know, the Absolutely. PhD about their words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so understatement of the year, right? Exactly. Yeah, no, no. That And that's exactly right. And, and you know, uh, there's certain words that the VA looks for. Right. And, you know, it's 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 very key, uh, you know, to include those words. And then, like you said, with the veterans, too, it's like, you know, oh, what was your MOS or, you know, like little words like that, which we just know, you know, that Absolutely. others don't. Yeah, that, you know, civilians aren't going to know that. But, you know, so your medical journey. Yeah. Don't know that much about doctors, okay? Just <laughs> kind of what I pick up on TV shows like Chicago Med. But it seems like nice. yeah, you definitely took a different path to it. You know, I know there's like residency and different steps. Obviously, you go to you go to like college and pre-med, then med school, and then you go get a job, then residency, then, you know, like there's different steps. So I, th I, I guess in my mind, I always thought it was one of those things like you become a resident first and then you get through that. Oh, so like, yeah. you didn't do that. So, so you ended up in the Air Force doing it and, and then went to residency. Yeah, it seem like a different path. I mean, because it seems like it to me. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. So the military is kind of strange with that. So so, you know, I, I did, you know, pre-med, you know, undergrad med school. And then when I was activated, what they had me do was do a general medical internship. Right. So if for a year, it's like a crash course in medicine. Right. That you're doing. And then you're a flight surgeon without a residency, which the military is the only place this happens nowadays, you know, that it's called like a general practitioner. Okay. You know? So that's what I thought was really interesting. I'm like, wait a yeah. minute. Like, it seems like there's a lot of hands on <laughs> 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 kind of explain some, do some doctors in some ways. 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That And that's why when I was like, all right, what am I going to do? What am I going to specialize in regular medicine or something else? You know, no, it provides a lot of it. I'm sure it provided a lot of interesting experience eventually going into psych. Just, you know, a lot of a background and different things that I guess maybe you might not get. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, um, you know, just doing like, uh, aeromedical evac, you know, evacuations, you know, things like that. And, um, and just, I mean, as you know, like so, just so much mental health, uh, you know, related issues in the military. Uh, so it gave me a ton of experience in that even before going to residency for psychiatry. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And a different, I mean, anybody can suffer from PTSD or mental health issues, but as veterans, we deal with it like, maybe the reasons are different or not making it better or worse or anything. It's just different cause of some of those things. High exactly. Environments, tempo, you know, combat stress, witnessing, you know, ter- you know, horrific things that are just different, you know, but I guess you can make an argument for, you know, somebody suffering with PTSD because they're seeing people die in the streets. There's no different than somebody in a, you know, in, in a city somewhere here in the United States seeing somebody die. It's yeah, just fair. So yeah. I guess when you look at it like that, but absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. And you're right. It's, it's very similar. I guess it just happens with more frequency to veterans because of the situations, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know like, I'm sure it's a lot different now, you know, the military culture I'm sure hasn't shifted much since we got out many years ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you know, the operations tempo is different. You know, this is, you know, we're recording this in 2022. You know, the pulled out of Afghanistan last year. Yes, we have operators, you know, operating, doing all kinds of crazy stuff that uh, none of us will ever know about in hundreds of countries across the globe. But, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan are over. You know, we don't have troops in those countries with deployment back to back to back to back anymore. Yeah. You know, and that's, that was a lot. You know, I know I know a lot of Vietnam veterans have a lot of issues from their one de- you know one deployment for a year. You know, when I was in Iraq, a lot of Army guys. I mean, they had taken it from twelve months to fifteen to eighteen. Wow. You know, it's like with like one or two breaks in there to come home for like a week or two. You barely let your guard down, and you're right back in the sandbox. Oh my gosh. You know, so it's like, uh, how do you ever decompress from that? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so you have no you have no time to to do so. Exactly. And and that's where like the brain comes in, right? Because it's like all right, so you're 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 deployed for all, you know, these long periods of time, right? And there's a part of the brain, right, which is our flight or fl- uh, fight or flight center, the amygdala. And that ends up being on like all the time for 12 months, 15, however long the deployment is, right? And, it, and then you come back and you're like, you got to turn it off, you know, and how do you do that? It's, it's, it's tough. Well, I don't think it happens in a two week decompression period. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's why I got back from both my deployments. Oh, congratulations. You're back. Do this paperwork and process back to the unit, whatever, you know, a day or so. And they're like, right. okay, go take two weeks off. Which for me, like, especially my first deployment, you know, I was, I was stationed in Japan at Yokota Air Base. Uh-huh. I had no family. I was a young single guy. And oh. it's like, okay, go decompress. You know, you have two weeks off. Yeah. You know what I did for two weeks? Sit in my room and drink and play video games. There you go. Wasn't yeah. exactly healthy things. <laughs> right. What else was I going to do? Exactly. You know, for two weeks. I wasn't yeah. going to go travel somewhere. What, you know what I mean? Didn't want to, you know, leave. And so, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, having people sit in their rooms for two weeks or go back to their family and try and reintegrate back into, you know, that now that husband or that wife that's been home. It's right. Dealing with the kids and, and the dynamics of the family. Now you're just stepping back into it. Those roles don't work. It takes, you know, a lot of guys I've talked to, it takes weeks, months to cycle back into the rotation. And then those guys are right back out the door again. Yeah. 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 I, it's a great point. Like I don't, and I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, besides like increasing the amount of time in between, you know, I mean, I realize we're not in that situation now, yeah. but you know, Oh uh, yeah. yeah, either yeah. increase the time in between or, you know, get more people in the military so that yeah. you know, people aren't exposed to that. Like, hey, you've done your time, now you got a, a couple years off. You know, exactly. I don't know how the Air Force is doing it now. I mean, I know, you know, when I went in, at least the Air Force at one point in time had, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was like buckets or something they called it. So, like, you would be eligible to, for most of the Air Force anyway, the rest yeah. of the Air Force, you were eligible to deploy, 
in this particular time frame, potentially. But then after that, he wouldn't be eligible until like you know four, five, six buckets later. So which could be like two or three years. That's right. Eligible for my career field, I was security forces. Oh. Uh, at one point in time, we were gone six months and back six months. Wow. And gone, gone again. Wow. You know, I, I did just under eight months. Turn around, a couple of months later, they sent me down to Ecuador. Not necess- not a, not a deployment. Okay, let's get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> On paper, it was a deployment. It wasn't a deployment. <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, I came back from there, came PCS to Scott Air Force Base, and then boom, turned right around and went back to, to Iraq. Wow. You know, so that wow. two-year period, was like gone home, gone home, you know. Like, that was just the tempo back then, for my career field anyway. No, that's, yeah, and, and that's and that's rough. Like, I, I feel like, and you're right, now that you said that, I, I had forgotten about the buckets. That's right, we had buckets. And, like, I had a bucket of a several months, you know, like, oh, okay, this is your vulnerable time, you know, when you could be deployed. So at least you know there's some you can expect it or or not you know or not yeah, expect yeah, there's it. A, there's a chance that you could go in that yeah. time frame somewhere maybe. You know, I mean, <laughs> I knew people in other career fields that had to fight and claw for years just to get on the list to go someplace when their time came up. That's true. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's it's, That's, it's it's different across one branch, let alone the, the different branches. Exactly. Yeah. And and your tempo sounds like uh. So when I was deployed, um, I. I, you know, uh, worked with um, a bomber unit where they used to do six months back home, six months deployed, and they just, it was like infinite, you know, and I was like, oh my God, like, how are you doing that, you know? Uh, But yeah, yeah, it sounds like that. You get just as much time to decompress. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, really, you get less. I mean, you got like, you know, in that situation, you only got two or three months to try and decompress and get more to a normal state. That's true. Before you have to be like, okay, you're about to get relieved of duty and go back to pre-deployment training and... You know, get all your qualifications and your shots and all those things. That, you know, all the 50 million places the Air Force made us, you know, get stamps or initials. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't even know if they checked all the things they were supposed to check at all those places. But all those motions you had to go through, you know. You know, right. so by the time you're, you get back to normal, you're ramping right back up to go again. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I guess both are like jar- jarring in some levels, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah, that, well, you know, that, that that was back in the day. Hopefully, I I really hope. I, I really don't know what the tempo is like today, but yeah, I hope it's a lot different for the troops today. Yeah, so, good point. But either way, everybody has mental health, right? You know, we we're all on the sliding scale of where we're at, good or bad. Yep. So, you know, like I kind of started to show off that people are having problems or you know looking to make a claim, things like that. Um, there might be some things they're not familiar with like a nexus letter or a dbq could you break down what those are for, for people absolutely yeah it's a great question and you know it's it's good to talk about it because uh nobody tells uh, tells you right <laughs> when nope. you're going through <laughs> you know you're just kind of you know you're just in the process so, so basically uh you know what it is is you know you have cl- different types of disability claims right and um you know if if somebody had an issue in the military let's just take for example uh you know they had a leg fracture when they were in the military and then they had pain that you know went on after they left the military right that's that's really a a good claim it's an easy claim you know you can you can easily make the claim and and uh submit the documentation you know go to your regular doctor and uh and and let them know you know i'm having this pain i had it fractured back uh, when I was serving, and then you submit all the records, and there's a pretty reasonable chance that you're going to get that approved. Oh, sure, right? because you, know, you, you went to the doctor when you were in, and the doctor yeah. was like, okay, yep, we, we took some x-rays, it's broken, here's your cast, you know, here's your profile for six months, you know, you know, whatever. Exactly. Like, here's a record of it, like what, what exactly how they treated it, what they did, what the diagnosis was. That's right. That's ex- yeah. It's it's like it's it's straightforward, right? You know, it's like all right, yeah, you know, done. Uh, uh, um, you know, it's easy, right? But, you know, that's where, and, you know, that's where we have the difficulties if the case is different, right? So let's say uh, we go with something else, right? Like, let's say somebody was deployed and, you know, they had to handle a lot of human remains, you know, so a lot of like chaplains, uh, chaplains assistants, they ha- handle human remains, right? And after that, you know, they never got seen, but they were having a lot of symptoms, like they were 
uh, hyper vigilant, you know, they're feeling pretty down. They're having a lot of anxiety, flashbacks, you know, nightmares, things like that, but they never told anybody, right. They just, you know, it's like, oh man, like m maybe they'll disqualify me if I tell them, you know, if then they diagnose me with something. Oh, well, there's uh, maybe, a very, very real fear there that you're going yes. to get, you know, like I said, our security forces. So I came back to my first deployment and they basically were like, oh, welcome back. Uh, if you want to talk to somebody, they're right through this door. Uh-huh. And nobody got up. And what? Because you, no, nobody got up. You know, it was yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I'm not getting up. You yeah. Get up? Nope, you're not getting up. You're not getting up either. <laughs> 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 you know, nobody wanted to be that person to kind of show that weakness. Like, no, you just made it through a deployment. You just, you know, you just were in the middle of Iraq and you did this, that, and the other, you know. And Yeah. Like, you don't want to show that weakness. Like, you just, you just, you just made it through that. Yeah, and that's such a... Like when we think about it, that's that's such a not a good way of doing it, right? Like it just showing it in front of everybody and being like, hey, if you need help, walk through that door. And everybody's like looking at everybody. It's yeah, like yeah. Uh, nobody's going to walk through that door because nobody wants to uh, show that in front of others. Like you're saying weakness. Yeah. You know, not that it is a weakness, but, you know, it's perceived. No, but there's this yeah. perceived weakness because, you know, unfortunately, in the military, you have to be. You have to be strong. You have to be there for your team. You have to be there for your battle buddies. Like you, you know, it takes everybody to pull off the mission and, yeah. and you can't really show a sign of weakness. Yes. Like, you know, cause everything is, it's all about the mission, but and it has to be, you know, in order for the military to work and to protect our country, it has to be a well-ordered machine like that. You don't want to change that, but you do need it, to it, recognize that that's the system. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, no. And, you know, you, you know, then you're worried about, oh, you know, I'm just gonna, it's going to put stress on my uh, teammates. You know, they're going to have to do more if I if I do something. You know, yeah, it's this infinite, infinite kind of <laughs> thought loop, you know, that you can go into. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's a darn shame, but yeah, it is what it is. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, um, the, the, your original question about uh, Nexus letter. So, so, you know, that person comes back, you know, they don't talk about it, then they get out of the military. And, you know, it's really affecting them, right? It's, you know, the flashbacks, the nightmares, they're not sleeping, they're irritable, they're having problems with their spouse, they, they get like irritated with coworkers, they're lashing out, you know, the supervisors like, man, what are you doing? You know, all of this stuff is happening and they're like, oh man, you know, it looks like I was really affected by that. I just didn't realize it, you know? And, um, and that's when they go to their uh, VA doctor and they start talking about it. Like, Hey, listen, this is uh, what I was going through. I didn't tell anybody I'm telling you now, and this is uh, what's happening. That's where a nexus letter can come in and really help the individual. So a nexus, what a nexus really means is a link or a connection. So and the goal of a nexus letter is to connect whatever the veteran has as a diagnosis to something in military service. Now, it doesn't have to be that the military service caused it directly. It just has to have happened during military service, right? It, if it caused it, then that's an even stronger claim, like, you know, some stressful incident or fracture or whatever. But um, but, but that's what a nexus letter is. It establishes a connection between the diagnosis and military service. Basically. Right. Cause without that connection, you're not going to get any, any disability rating or anything. Exactly. It requires, that, it requires the diagnosis and the connection. That's right. There's yeah. There's a piece in there somewhere, but you know, it, it all has to sync and you have to prove that to the VA to some random person sitting in an office. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, exactly. It's reading your story on paper, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, you can submit your personal statement, right, which says like, oh, this is what happened and everything, which is good. That is a part of the evidence, you know, um, and, and you can certainly submit a claim without a nexus. But but the nexus kind of adds weight to it because it's also coming from an independent uh, uh, physician, right? Somebody who's not a part of your treatment team. You know, they're not they're not biased. You know, they're just they're independent, you know, so I mean, it's, yeah. like, it's a lot like a court case yeah you know it's like oh we arrested you for shoplifting right but they're like we don't have any evidence we just know you did it you know versus like oh we 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 have somebody in the store saw you we have video camera evidence we found it on your person like you're just kind of building all those connections to be like well, see all the evidence is here yes like the case is going to get thrown out if you get arrested for shoplifting and they have no evidence versus 
Well, um, there's clear and obvious evidence here. Like, yeah, we see you on video doing it. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know the best analogy I've got of like, you just want, you want to be like the police and gather as much evidence as possible. Like make it a slam dunk case. Yeah. That's a, that's a great uh, comparison actually, because it is kind of like you're a detective, right? You're just like going through and like, cause you know, when I'm reading a medical record, I'm like, I'm going through and I'm trying to find like where, you know, everything is and, and uh, to establish that, uh, that connection. So yeah, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. just, just like the timelines too. Like, okay, does it, does, does everything line up? You know, I mean, I've gone through claims a couple of times, you know, and they always ask those questions in those processes with the doctors. Like, okay, tell me when this started. Yes. Okay, did, did it get worse? You know, like what happened next? You know, yeah. kind of things, yeah. which I'll tell you what is really hard. I would, my piece of advice to anybody getting out of the military is go file your claim immediately when you get out. Yes. Because when you file another claim 10 years later, like I just did last year, and they start asking questions, and you're like, I, this particular year? What do you know, a month? <laughs> yeah. it's been over 10 years no i don't remember exactly what i mean sometime right. there there i can't pinpoint it you know what i mean so when it's fresher in your mind you can more accurately articulate the dates and the times and be more precise with things because after a uh, while trust exactly me, you'll, you'll right out of your head that's right yeah no i agree 100 percent. and and like so that's the best advice get seen as soon as you're out and if you're still in and you're listening to this you know, at least talk about it at your separation physical, because at least at that point you can get it on the record and it's on the record while you're still in the military before you get out, you know? And, and, and you know, I mean, uh, you know, I guess they could disqualify you right before you get out, but I, I, I think that is the safest time if you're really worried about getting disqualified, you know? Yeah, I mean, just go, to, you really need to go to the doctor for anything that you have. Like I rolled my, my left ankle like three or four times. Uh -huh. You know, and I just go to the doctor, you know, painkillers, whatever, and stay off of it, ice it, whatever. I never thought anything of it. When I got out and went for my initial claim, they, they start looking back through, and they're like, well, you went to the doctor four times for your ankle. Does it bother you? And I'm like, I mean, every now and then I'll, you know, twist it, whatever. So I've had a zero rating on my left ankle for 11 years or so now. There you go. Whatever it's been, you know. So yeah. the good news is, like, that's covered. Should something ever happen in the future and it gets worse or, you know, a weakness or whatever, you know, and that's just one of those things like, I mean, never really thought about it. It was just like, hey, could you give me a, like a brace and some painkillers you know, oh, last right. couple of days and let the swelling go down, you know? Because <laughs> for some reason we had to do PT in a field with potholes, you know, holes in it, you know, whatever. Yeah, right, right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. They always have the nicest facilities, even in the Air Force. Yes, Marines, we said the dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. how does that, um, you know, so we got the, the, the Nexus letters is those letters, and the DBQs is just basically the outline of like what each, what they're looking for in each one of those, correct? That's right, yeah. So th that was the other part of your question, DBQs. So those are the disability benefits questionnaires, which is like the VA form uh, outlining the condition. It's very robotic, as, <laughs> as you would expect from the VA. It's like, oh, check mark, you know, check boxes and things like that. And and so, you know, the person doing the Nexus letter for you, um, you should be doing the DBQ. At least I do that. And, and you know, you go through and do it. The DBQ is easy. I, I think the Nexus letter is the one that carries the most weight because it's like a narrative, you know. It very nicely should describe, like, everything that's going on. But you're right. The DBQ is still important because the VA looks for it, and they look for the buzzwords from the DBQ as well exactly you know yeah. like i know when it comes to mental health I, I don't remember the exact words but like there's certain things at the certain rating levels you've got what uh the minimum is what 10 10 30 50 70 100 i believe at like 100 percent for ptsd you, you almost have to be darn near having a caregiver incapable of managing your own finances uh personal hygiene i think something some things like that in there i've, I've read through those before um, one of just a few <laughs> DBQs yeah. that I've ever read through because it's any uh, anything from the VA, you know, it's, it'll put you to sleep reading it too long. But, Abs you know, it kind of basically outlines what generally you would expect in those ranges. It, exactly. Yeah. No, no. And and you, you described it perfectly. It's it's like near having a caregiver for 100%. It, it's like total 
social and occupational impairment, you know, like no ADLs, which is like activities of daily living, like not just not able to do personal hygiene and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, you're right. And, and it, you know, there's a whole range, of course, of percentages. In there well. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. it's important for anybody going through any claim. True. To kind of read those because those are the ones I've ever read. I've definitely never pulled up the manual and started finding random things to read about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, it is interesting to, to kind of see what they're looking for. And some yeah. things won't make any sense you know, if they start getting technical with like joints and movement percentages and range. And I mean, that's true. I don't know any of that stuff. It's going to be like reading a foreign language, but yeah, is what it, it is. So that's true. Yeah. Unless you Google a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. Right? I've got a fair, fair amount of Googling. There's some websites <laughs> out there, but so you said you help people through the process. What, what exactly are you doing? Explain uh, that to everybody. Sure. Uh, so sorry, you cut out for a second. Could you repeat that? Yeah. So you know, so you're helping people with the nexus letters and stuff like that. Can you just maybe explain for everybody more of what you're doing? To, to oh yeah. Company? Absolutely. Yeah. So basically, um, well, you know, I do. You know, anybody that I partner with, I do both the nexus letter and the DBQ, uh, no matter what, because you know they're both really important and. Um, so what I do is I write nexus letters uh, for folks who have any type of mental health condition that either popped up during the military service or uh, was worsened by military service. So, you know, when we t think about depression, so that's like major depressive disorder, adjustment disorder, anxiety, PTSD, insomnia, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and usually, you know, I'm helping the folks who have a gap. They don't have that connection, right? So the folks who have the connection, meaning they were seen in the military for any of these mental health conditions, and they get out and they make the claim, it's pretty clear, it's easy, and um, there's no nexus needed. I'm there to fill in the gap where somebody might need a connection, that nexus done. And, and so what I usually do is... Um, you know, people email me and then we do a phone consultation. We just talk about the case first because I don't want to, you know, take anybody on and have them pay a fee if, the, if I can't help them. You know, what's the point of that, right? You know, if Makes I sense. can't help them. Yeah. So once I verify like, oh, okay, you know, uh, it sounds like I can help you. Uh, then we connect via email. We, uh, I have a HIPAA compliant email. I have them send their records to me. I review the records just to double check everything. Um, and then we actually schedule the video evaluation to do the formal evaluation. And, and then I write up the nexus letter for them, basically. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, not only um, one other thing is like secondary conditions. So um, a, a lot of what? folks, yeah, a lot of folks don't know um, uh, and it's not their fault, but you can get depression from chronic pain from an injury during military service. You can have um, irritable bowel syndrome that worsens because of anxiety. You know, people who might have be having a lot of uh, bowel movements all the time, um, things like that. Uh, PTSD can be worsened by sleep apnea. Um, you know, uh, tons of secondary conditions too, basically. You know. Yeah, but it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there's other things in there uh, like GERD, you know, so acid reflux and stuff like that is another like secondary to PTSD. I've heard that like erectile dysfunction is another thing, although it's not apparently a actual rated claim. It's like a special thing. Anyway, it's a different topic, different day. But there's there's quite a few different different things. I believe is is weight gain like or uh, weight control or things like that related to as a secondary. To yes, yeah, it can. Um, so usually what I try to link that with is a medication that causes weight gain that is being used for treating depression, right? Or, or something, or PTSD, or whatever that the case may be. I have noticed that when we try to say weight gain was secondary to the mental illness itself, that is something that can be connected, but it's tough. The VA is really, you know, they really fight back on that one. Um, but, but, you know, I try to gauge it case by case. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. I mean, you know. You could just be overstuffing your mouth too. <laughs> right, sure. Right, right. That's, that's kind of a tough one for sure. So, yeah. You know, so you know, one of the the things, you know, that I, what I wanted to ask you about next, now that people have an idea of what you do, 
and the nexus letters and all this stuff. I know when it comes to mental health, one of the things that you kind of have to articulate to the VA is one of two things. And maybe there's a third one you can enlighten me, but occupational impairment and social impairment. Can you can you break down like what those kind of look like? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and you bring up a like a fantastic point because the more that you can verbalize this to your VA doctor or your regular doctor, the better it is because then in the records it's consistent, you know? Because it is, I mean, if this stuff is happening to you, it is happening to you whether it's in the record or not, right? And yeah. so- You want them to put an easy timeline together. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Everything just falls in line. Exactly. And, and they can see like, oh, this guy's been consistent. You know, it's like, all right, yeah, he's always been saying this, right? And so, so yeah, so um, we can start with occupational, which tends to be the big one. Um, so how is the condition impacting your job or difficulties in your job, right? So, and this can be a lot of different things, right? So maybe the PTSD is giving you such bad insomnia that you go to work and you're just like in a brain fog the whole time because you just didn't get any sleep last night, you know? and it's, it's something that recurs, you know, it, it happens pretty regularly. Uh, that's a big occupational impairment right there because, um, you know, in most jobs, you got to be able to focus, concentrate, you know, uh, you got to take tasks from your supervisor, whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a big thing. Um, there's also irritability. I've noticed like irritability is a big thing in, in these conditions like depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD, where, you know, because it, it's almost like, you know, if you have a cup of reserve energy, um, if, if there's person A who's completely without any mental illness and completely healthy, they've got a full cup of reserve, but somebody who's struggling with like severe PTSD, their reserve is like 20%, right? So there's only so much that they can pour out of their cup. And then um, before they kind of get really annoyed or frustrated quickly. Uh, so irritability is a big one where people might be lashing out at their coworkers, um, you know, verbally kind of answering back to their supervisors. And then later on, they regret it. You know, they're like, oh, man, like, that's not me. That's not my personality. I've never been this way. Uh, it's happening to me. So um, that's another occupational impairment. Um, so like I mean, things like that. Go over in social, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know. Or yeah, just, you know that that person that you know that's just grumpy all the time, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it could be that, or it could just be grumpy. <laughs> uh, sure, it is possible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. It could be a feature of a personality, right? And it could be a personality trait. But, but you know, if you notice, it's like uh, really different for that person. They could be struggling with a, a mood disorder or PTSD or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen in in the workplace. You know, absolutely. Like, the way it's and explained to me is, you know, it's you really need to sit back and reflect on how, you know, everything is affecting you and how does it affect you in the workplace. That's right. Exactly. And and just even little things, right? If you if you're just like not focusing and concentrating as much as you used to, um, maybe it's anxiety. Maybe your palms are sweaty all the time. You're looking over your shoulder, you know. Uh, uh, you know, you're driving a forklift and you always feel like everything's going to collapse. You know, the, the warehouse is going to collapse around you, whatever, right? Like whatever setting you're in that you're imagining. Um, and I'm just remembering examples from different folks I've seen. It's like, you know, these are these are real things that happen and are rooted in uh, things that you went through in the military, potentially. You know? Absolutely. So how about social impairment? Is there anything specific, you know, that tends to be just in that category or? Yeah. I, and, and I think you mentioned it before, like uh, that, you know, the irritability really goes into the social side. And I see that a ton in terms of that getting easily annoyed with uh, uh, like your spouse or your kids, you know, things like that, you know, um, being very depressed to the point of not being able to interact as much with family. So, you know, a lot of veterans will tell me like, I just don't want to go anywhere. You know, I just don't want to leave the house. I, I'd rather just sit in my room and I, and you know, I, I don't want to do that. I, I'd really love to go out with my kids, you know, get ice cream, you know, go to the amusement park, whatever, but I just can't do it. I, I just feel like I can't leave. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. You know, I just can't get myself out of my room. So, you know, things like that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's significant though for sure. What would you say would be 
the most common things that you see between you know both of them yeah um between uh social and occupational yeah, between social and occupational yeah. you, know, you like got the most it common yeah. thing that you see yeah so um i would say the most common thing in uh social impairment is irritability that has been s extremely common uh i think it's it's in almost every letter i feel like you know that i write that um surprise me that describes right? most, most vets i know <laughs> okay <laughs> there you go I mean, god this sounds really bad to say that but i mean sure. it does like you know everybody can be cool but you know you, i know a lot of guys who you know push the wrong way or the wrong you know right situation and they get they can get pretty irritable irate angry frustrated about things so i've definitely seen that a absolutely yeah and i and i think you know um you know I, and i think this would be interesting to study uh but in veterans I, I think it's because of the training itself right and what you have to go through where there's a lot of immediate reactions that happen in training you know and the things that we do in the military it's very reactionary, so I think I think it's almost like conditioning that happens over time. Sometimes, you know. Well, I think you know. Sometimes, one thing I've noticed because I would also throw myself in that boat. Sometimes is irritable. Sure. But like <laughs> just expectations, you know, uh -huh. like showing up early to something, and then you have people show up late, and I may not voice that, but I would definitely feel it on the inside. Oh. Of like. Why is this person showing up late? Do they just not care? What, what you know, this person is this piece of shit? You know, like, yeah. what, what is going on? Like, do you just not care about your, your team, your mission, you're doing whatever you're doing, you know, like, or just the, just the repeat things that people would do. Like, yes. you know, you, in the military, you don't walk and talk on your, on your cell phone in uniform. You don't walk with your hands in your pocket as a civilian, whatever. I can get past that one. But just like sure. people that would, you know, play on their phone unnecessarily or something like that, or they'll be doing things on their phone or a tablet when in a meeting. And I've been in meetings where it's like that. And I've been in them too, where I'm like, hey, I'm going to take, you know, I'll just be like, hey, I'm taking notes on my phone. Just, every, you know, like I'm actually using it to take notes. But I, you, know, sure. you, you can look next to you and the person's playing Angry Birds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Like they're not paying attention. It's like, what are you even doing here? Yeah. You know, it's just like, it kind of just makes your blood curdle a little bit. Like, what are you doing? Like, come yeah. on. Yeah, we're here for a mission for a team. It's it's time to dive in. Or meetings running starting late. You know, it, it's it's so interesting that you said that because I can re I can think back to as soon as I got out, um, I I went to residency, you know, and I, and I was in fir first year where you have to walk around with the chief doctor, and the chief doctor teaches all the all the you know training doctors and things, right? And so there was a med student who was on his phone, like not taking notes, right? Just like on his own stuff. And I and I was like, it was inside as well. Like I didn't say anything, but I was just like, man, like exactly your response. Like, do you not care? Like we're all here to take care of patients and we have a, a common purpose, you know, do you not care about that? Like, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it happens to a lot of us, just those little things, you know, if not 15 minutes early, you're late, this, that, you know. That's still to this day after all these years. If I'm running late to something, oh, it, it, I hate running late. Like, yeah. If, if I got to be somewhere with my wife and my kids, let's say it's uh, 5 p.m. and it's 30 minutes to get there and I got to drop my kids off at my mom's, I'll tell my wife to be ready at like 4.15 or I yeah. mean 3.15. So be like, okay, so I tell her 3.15. I'm lying to her because we, <laughs> we absolutely need to leave by like 3.45 to get the kids, to, you know, somewhere at 4. So we got plenty of time on the road, and then we're still 10 or 15 minutes early. Yeah. Like in my mind, I've got this timeline already built of, like, this is when we need to be here. Here's all the timeline steps, the, you know, the, the waypoints, if you will, of, like, how we're going to get there. Waypoints, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, like, it's just driving me nuts. Like, if we're, like, two minutes past one of them, like, I start freaking out on the inside of, like, oh, we're so late now. Oh, man, we're so late. <laughs> I hate being late. It's like I've, I've already built in like 20 extra minutes to be there early. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it's it's going to be okay. But, you know. You've got, you've got a tactical map, you know, waypoints and everything. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's now fantastic. my wife knows all my secrets. I mean, she she knows I do that to her from time to time. She's sure. like, well, what time do I need to be ready? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you what time. Because <laughs> it still happens. But, yeah, yeah anyway. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's not a big it's just deal, like in the, but. Yeah. 
it's just like in the military, right? You know, the the you know uh, the wing commander uh, will say we got to meet for formation at 9 a.m. You know, and then the person below that will say, all right, we're gonna get there at 8:30. The person before that is like 7:30. You know, and then all of a sudden you're out there at like 6 a.m. waiting yeah, for yeah, people. those young airmen out there like I didn't even go to sleep last night, Sarge. <laughs> 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 well, I got two hours. No, it's, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It, it is what it is. That I. I that, I think those things stick with us for a really long time. And yeah. it, it's normal. I think after so many years, you get over it a little bit more. I know the first couple of years, I mean, that some of those things that people run and leave or whatever, it's just really bothered me. Yeah. And now I'm like, look, you know what? Civilians just operate on a different frequency than we do. Exactly. Do. Just have yeah. to be okay with it. Acceptable. That not everybody's going to see the world the way that you do. And once you kind of realize that, it, you know, it eases those a little bit. You just, you let it go. You know what? I'm going to do what I can do yeah. what makes me feel good but i have no control <laughs> of that person so that's right yeah. that's right that's a good philosophy yeah absolutely so you know last thing one of the last things i want to ask you here some people when it comes to mental health may have a problem doing this so if they've never gone to anybody especially a mental health provider but they've got their primary care provider let's just say how should they start that conversation with them of like hey i'm struggling because I know when I go to my doctor to VA, they'll just flat out ask, have you had suicidal thoughts? Have you had this? Have you had that? I think some people lie, you know, or they yeah. just kind of stretch the truth or whatever. But how should somebody start verbalizing this stuff and start on the path to getting help and building a paper trail for their eventual claim? Yeah, no, that's a yeah, fantastic question. And, yeah, so basically, you know, and, and it's tough, right? We, you know, just recognizing that, systemically in the VA, it's, it's really tough doing this, right? Because, and I'm not trying to, you know, obviously there's understaffing in the VA, things like that. I know, you know, it's a, like a system issue. Um, but, you know, it is tough because, you know, I review a ton of VA records and the biggest thing I see is that it's like variable, right? It's um, some records are pretty good and they describe things. And then in other records, it's one sentence for a visit that might have been 30 or 40 minutes, right? You know, it's like, oh, man, like, yeah. I wish, yeah, like, I, I really wish there was more information in this, right? And I, I, I wonder what they talked about, right? Like, I, I wonder, you know, what happened. So, um, so recognizing that and saying, like, all right, it's, you know, recognizing the frustration that sometimes no matter what you do, it's, it, it might not get in there. But that's only in one visit, right? So what I, that's why I tell people, tell all your providers, right? Which is difficult. I know it's 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 difficult to do that. It's you difficult. Feel like bringing, a broken record, bringing it up all the time again. You know, which makes I think some people make makes them feel like, well, like sounding like you know I've, I've got all these problems, which <laughs> I guess you do. You know, but you, you like you're you're the greasy wheel. You know, you just keep bringing it up over and over and over again. But that's the only way to make sure that it's in your records enough. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And and that's the best way to describe it. It's, you know, and 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 it helps you no matter what, right? Like, let's say you talk about it three times, it gets in there once. Great. If you talk about it three times, it's in there three times. Fantastic. Right. That that's, you know, that that's really good. So, what I usually tell folks is. Um, broach the topic and just say, Hey doc, you know, um, I wanted to talk to you about something that's, you know, it's tough for me to talk about, you know, and, um, and, you know, I've debated bringing it up or not, but I, but I just wanted to, and I wanted to tell you, and, and that's, you know, you kind of bring it up that way and say, this is what I've been dealing with, right? These, you know, I, I've noticed, you know, I've had trouble focusing and concentrating and I'm always on edge, you know, I'm looking over my shoulder you know, people look at me and they're, they're they kind of, you know, I feel like they're perceiving me as being odd uh, because I'm doing these things, you know, whatever it is. Right. And, and you start kind of talking through it. And, you know, I think most providers or doctors, hopefully, right, as they hear like how it's impacting you, there's more empathy there. Right. So uh, not that they, sh you know, obviously they should have empathy no matter what. But sometimes when we just focus on the symptoms, like, oh, I've had a tough time sleeping or I'm irritable, and I say that, um, it doesn't bring about as much response or empathy as if I talk about how it's impacting me, I guess, right? And so That's a good one, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and and as you talk about that then you know they'll they'll really begin to understand like oh, all right you know this is really tough and hopefully they're, they're going to be documenting that and also helping right and also being like hey like maybe you want me to refer you to you know cognitive behavioral therapy or do you want me to re uh, prescribe a medication and that's good too because that also uh, two things the first thing is it helps you right um if you're struggling with a mental health issue it helps you deal with it process it get treated for it and the second thing it, it adds to that paper trail as well uh, for the claim because it shows that you're seeking out this treatment and you've been tried on different things you know therapy yeah. medication things like that well yeah. you mentioned empathy and i think that's an interesting thing with doctors because in, in all my years i'm on my I'm counting right, fifth doctor. At oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I get one for like a year and then they're gone for whatever reason. You know, it's, it's oh, the man. system. You yeah. know, but you know, every doctor I've had has, you know, I've liked certain things about one versus the other. You know, my first doctor, she didn't have much empathy. <clears throat> she didn't have a lot of bedside manners. She was more of a to the point, point blank, like, you know, this is what you need to do, whatever. Not a real warm person. And, uh, you know, my second doctor, I, I kind of jokingly refer to him as like a hippie. And this guy was like, whatever, you know, <laughs> we'll do this, we'll do that, whatever, you know. He sent me some pills for one thing once. He was like, yeah, we'll just wait a year. We'll, we'll test, you know, we'll do some blood tests next year, see what happens. And then I get pills two weeks later and I call him up and I'm like, what happened? And he's like, yeah, you know, I had a change of heart after you left and I decided we're going to try this. And I'm like, wow. okay, I just want to make sure, you know, like the pills are legitimately for me. <laughs> Because this is contrary to what we just talked about, you know. Right. Then I had an older doctor, you know, he, he, he ended up retiring. But, you know, just, just a totally different personality. And so, yeah, you, know, you kind of got to get to know your doctor, which you may not have a whole lot of time to do and yeah. kind of build that comfort. You know, I probably have a better relationship with my current doctor than I did with any of the ones prior. Ah. Just because of personality. I've seen her less than the rest of them. But, like, that bedside manner, that, that, that connection – an ability to kind of freely talk that yeah no that's a huge i feel like that's such a huge factor right like it makes you more comfortable too if there is a positive good bedside manner i feel like it makes you more comfortable to talk about things too you know yeah and, well there's worse things uh, you could be trying to talk to your doctor about right right sure <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in my opinion i know there's a stigma around mental health but i think that there's some things that you could come to your doctor and try and talk about that i would think it'd be a little bit more embarrassing Absolutely. Oh, like yeah. Problems down there as a guy, or things that you might have caught from a partner, or yeah, urinating on yourself like every day, or like I mean, trying to make a joke out of it. But like, I would find that a little bit more embarrassing than talking about, hey, like I'm, I don't feel like I'm 100 percent up here, need some help. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I agree with that 100. <laughs> percent There's way more embarrassing things. So. <laughs> yeah, I can think of a few more, but you know, I, I won't. You know, but. <laughs> We don't want to plan any ideas for people. Uh, but, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the, the no, point it, exactly. is, is and more. Yeah. And one thing I thought of, you know, just as, as you were talking also, like another option, and I realize this is not an option for everybody, right? So this is very much situation dependent. But if you really feel like you're not getting traction at the VA, if you do have like another insurance, right? Like um, maybe it's through your job or something else or through a partner, uh, you know, try, go go to a, a doctor in that uh, insurance plan, you know, go to somebody private and tell them about it and develop a relationship and then request the records from there, you know, and get the help you need. You know, that's another good one. There's also the vet center and I'm, I'm not super knowledgeable on the vet center. I do believe you have to have been a combat veteran of some sort or a survivor of oh. military sexual trauma, I believe. Oh. They may have some couples counseling or something. I don't know. Somebody will probably let me know for sure. But there's some other things there because it's kind of like in the VA system, but not kind of on the outside of it, you know, but so if you qualify for whatever, whatever the case is there, I mean, that could be another way to get a, see a counselor. That's a great idea. So yeah. Or nonprofits. I mean, there's some nonprofits out there that might, you know, uh, I know one here in my area, I interviewed like a month ago, you know, for people here in our area that, you know, they realize that there's uh, it can take weeks to get into the VA for your cat for a counselor. So for those people that are struggling, you know, they could call and go to a local doctor's office and get a couple of visits for free and get some of that stuff off their plate, you know, get, wow. get things off your off their chest, you know, to try and curb that suicide rate. Wow. You know, so, I mean, wow. a wonderful local nonprofit, great, great people that run it, you know, they, and they started under tragic circumstances. But 
they're just one of many nonprofits out there that are doing things like that. That you know, maybe you don't want to go to the VA. Maybe you don't want, you don't have another insurance. Maybe a nonprofit is the way to go. That's if there's something that supports that. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm so glad uh, they're doing that. Um, yeah, uh, I hope more. Yeah, I hope more organizations like that come up too to kind of fill in that gap. Exactly. Well, you yeah. know, that's one thing with veterans we know <laughs> how to get into things in the VA, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So last thing I, you know, I was going to ask you here was uh, appeals. You know, oh. how, how should somebody kind of handle that process? You know, if you, you get put in for it, you went through all the motions because there's a lot of them and you get denied, you know, an appeal. What kind of things should they be on the lookout for there? Yeah. So, you know, that, that's the, I think that's probably the toughest, one of the toughest things is the appeals, right? Because it's so complicated. And, um, so the, the main thing with appeals is you want to get more information, right? That would help your claim, right? So, um, and there's a couple of options with this, right? You, you, you know, speaking on the, you know, doing it yourself is you want to get more information. So maybe you want to go to the doctors again. You want to talk about more things that are going on that you might not have talked about before. Uh, you want to get more records, any other procedures you had done if, the, if it was based on a procedure, things like that. You want to look at not only your own personal statement, but maybe a buddy statement, like maybe a buddy letter uh, from uh, somebody you served with. So let's say like Let's say, for instance, you're going for obstructive sleep apnea and you had a buddy who always used to, you know, uh, complain about you snoring or something like that. And, and you know, right. right yeah. <laughs> I can see that happening a few times for a few people. Right. <laughs> exactly. And so you bring that buddy, you know, you, you talk to them and be like, hey, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Would you be comfortable writing something like this up? You know, very simple, you know, and that, that would be a buddy letter that could add as evidence, right? You could add a spouse letter, right? You know, the spouse noticed this happening since you were in the military and it's and it's worsening, whatever. And you want to take that evidence as much as you can from collaterals and everything, and you want to add that uh, for the appeal. Now, I will say, like, um, and, uh, you know, I think the hard part is getting everything right with the paperwork. And um, I do think that sometimes... And I don't have like an agency to recommend, but sometimes going through like a law firm or an agency can be helpful. Um, yeah, you know, if it's really complicated, right? Because if it gets really complex, it's hard to keep track of everything. And you know, the VA has these experts weighing in, and they're legal advisors, and it's just you. So sometimes it's difficult, you know, to kind of balance that. You're a little outgunned and, in those situations. Yeah. 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 You're you're up against the wall. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And. You know, there are a lot of agencies that um, that what they do is uh, they won't charge anything up front um, and, you know, uh, you can go into it free and and then they just take a percentage of whatever you're compensated for in the future, um, you know, for a set amount of time for maybe two months or three months or something. And, you know, what you know, there are certain you know, there are certain places like that. Again, I'm not endorsing anyone, but uh, uh, but sometimes when it's really complex, that might be a way to go um, because some of these cases, you know, I look at it and I'm like, wow, like this is, I, I could not navigate this <laughs> amount of paperwork, you know? So. Yeah, I mean, some of them, I think for some people, it should be pretty cut and dry. But I mean, I think there's basically three ways you can go about the claim or appeal or whatever, is you can do it yourself, which I would never recommend. Or you can go to your county, state, whatever, uh, veteran service officer, maybe through a nonprofit That's right. like AMVETS or something like that, or DAV, I think, does them too. Or you go to one of these law firms and say, hey, help me out, your, your lawyers, whatever. I don't know any of them off the top of my head. But, sure. you know, certainly, especially, you know, I don't know that I would recommend that for the first time or the second time. But if you if you had to try like a third or fourth time, yeah, you're probably in your third or fourth year battling this. And maybe it's worth considering coughing up some of that money that, that, that you get if, you, if your claim goes through to force it through, you know. That's right. That's a, I, I like that um, kind of stepwise method, you know, if it's been a few times, then it's like, all right, maybe it's time to call in, you know, uh, some good backup, you know, and uh, yeah, for sure. And I totally forgot to mention, you're right, the VSOs, the VSOs, a lot of VSOs are fantastic, uh, and they can really help with, with the appeals. 
Yeah, I just ran into one of my local VSOs the other day on, on, on Veterans Day, you know. Nice. You know, I had a hat on. I don't, I don't always wear a hat since I'm a veteran, but, you know, it was Veterans Day, so you got to do it, right? You know, he runs into me. He's like, hey, man, how you good? You good on claims? And I'm like, yeah, why? He goes, well, I'm a VSO at, you know, at Curry <laughs> County. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I already got my guy over there, but <laughs> we're already in the process. He goes, good, man. I'm just looking out. He goes, everybody I see today, I'm just making sure they're getting taken care of. Wow. You know, which is kind of cool, you know. So That's it, really it, awesome. Good group of guys and gals over there for, for my local one. I, I've, done, I've known a couple of them over there. And they're good people. They work hard for you. That's amazing. Yeah. No, that's well, really good to hear. Yeah. And it helps when it's a, uh, an office full of veterans, too. You know, like, they, they get it. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely options out there. I would recommend people start with the VSO. I wouldn't, I can't imagine any scenario where it makes any sense to try and do the paperwork yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah That'd i agree yeah yeah so. it's really it's it's like it, it's difficult to comprehend and there's there's like auxiliary forms for things <laughs> like like and they and it's they tell you but it's like buried in the fine print so yeah i, I agree oh, yeah they all look the same it's like all basic information at the top and then the bottom looks the same but it's a slightly different form with the title and form number but everything else is basically the same and it's, you know i, I know i've I've looked through everything that I've ever gotten from my VSO, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, gosh, this is a lot of apparently redundant paperwork here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't even know what I'm looking at, but I'm like, hey, look, I trust you. I can see what you put in here, the rest of this. I don't know what all this is, but, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's a great... Uh... If you had to summarize, like, uh, you know, processes, bureaucratic red tape, it's, it, at the VA, it's like redundancy, you know? It's all yep. redundancy. Yep. Uh, well, I think most vets didn't, re you know, probably don't realize when you go in that when you get out and you want to do anything with the VA, you're probably in for a harder fight than you've probably had any other time in your life. You know, it, just, it is what it is. It's, it's a government agency. There's a lot of people, a lot of processes, red tape, oversight. And I get it. And there should be some of that but it, it's frustrating you know especially exactly. if you feel like you know like like hey i i fit this like i should have like i legitimately feel like i've got this problem or whatever and this is how it's bothering me and you just can't translate that to the government exactly it's frustrating exactly and and you know yeah like you're saying there shouldn't be like big roadblocks you know like it's it's you know and really the burden like sort of the the burden of proof you know we say is it just has to be the the condition has to be connected and it should be as likely as not that's the minimum standard right for claims is as likely as not so um it doesn't have to be highly likely i mean if it's it's great if it's highly likely right but um so i i wish that you know it was they would recognize that a bit more and it's like as likely as not is the minimum and and take away some of these roadblocks i guess you know uh, absolutely i couldn't yeah. agree more so yeah. But it's the system, and now, I mean, a lot more people are more educated on how that system is and how it works, and uh, and I really appreciate you coming on here and kind of sharing and breaking some of that down, because I know, it, it, especially if somebody hasn't been through it, it, it looks like this huge mountain that you have to climb in front of you, and if you've got the right people in your corner, you can do this. Absolutely, absolutely. Glad to do it. Uh, you know, it was great, great conversation. Thanks for having me on as well. I, I feel like... Uh, we talked about a lot of important topics, and uh, it was fun. So. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack. I, I can see yeah. some people having to listen to this one a second or third time just to get all their ducks in a row and figure out what they need to do. But, hey, if that's what, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes, right? Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. Go, go out there and put in your claims, get, get what's owed to you. And, you know, if you've got these problems and issues from your time in service, you know, and it's, it's truly legitimately connected to it, then, you know, go out there and fight for, for your – right to compensation on that exactly you know? agreed you put, you put your mind and body you know through the ringer for it so yes you deserve it right? absolutely so yeah. anyway i appreciate you doc coming on here and, and talking hey. to us and sharing anytime keith thanks again for having yeah. me on it was awesome <laughs> all right there you have it folks hope you enjoyed that uh once again you go check out my website battlebuddypodcast.net and like i always say if there's a resource that's not on there that you think should be Reach out and let me know. And if you've been struggling with anything, you know, you feel like you're at the end of your rope, uh, at the end of the line, remember the suicide hotline number is 988-PRESS-1, or you can text 838-255.